All right, welcome everybody. Hello and welcome to the Mon Montana Office of Public Instruction, Indian Education for All's Indian Boarding Schools from History to Healing webinar series. This is our last webinar, it's been amazing. My name is Jennifer Statham and I am an Indian Education for All Implementation Specialist. We are so glad that you've joined us for this important series. Tonight is our final boarding school uh, webinar, as I mentioned. However, please save the date boarding school registrants, please save the date for March 17th, 18th. We will be hosting our 16th annual Indian Education for All Conference here in Helena. Watch for details to come that will include uh, information on a workshop based on this series and all of the registrants uh, from the boarding school series will give um, preference for enrollment since we'll have to cap enrollment with our location. But each webinar has been recorded and is available on our Indian Ed webpage. Please note that participants will remain muted with their cameras off so we can focus on our presenter and their content. Feel free, though, to use the chat throughout if you have any questions, comments, um, and then we'll take a few minutes at the end also for uh, Q&A. Uh, your feedback on the feedback surveys uh, from our other webinars has brought you this boarding school series and the upcoming uh, workshop in March. So please make sure to complete those surveys, whether you're seeking uh, professional development units or, or as they were known as renewal units. Um, but fill that survey out anyway, because folks, your feedback has been so valuable um, and so meaningful. Thank you so much for taking the time to let us know what you think, what you want, want more of, and, um, and questions you might have. And I reach out to you um, as I can. So I, I will get to all of them if you have any questions in, in your feedback forms. But that survey will only be open until 3 p.m. tomorrow. So please do make sure to get that done. Uh, tonight should only take you four or five minutes unless you have a lot to say, of course. So tonight, I would like to welcome Sarah Young. Sarah is an enrolled member of the Absalica Nation of Montana. She grew up on her home reservation in South Central Montana. She completed her degree in social science in secondary ed from Montana State University Billings. She taught Crow Studies at Lodgegrass High School, then went on to Montana State University Bozeman, where she completed a Master's of Education in Educational Leadership, and later completed much of her coursework uh, for her doctorate. And Sarah served as an educator on the Crow Reservation at Pretty Eagle School as principal, Lodgegrass Schools as assistant superintendent, and Northern Cheyenne Lame Deer School superintendent, and at Bozeman School District, where she was the executive director of personnel, and then went on to Montana State University Bozeman to become the director of American Indian Research Opportunities. Uh, she was instrumental in including Montana tribal colleges in the initial idea network for biomedical research grant for the National Center for Research Resources at the National Institute of Health. In 2002, she received a presidential award for excellence in science, math, and engineering mentoring, a national award for her many years of mentoring American Indian students at Montana State University and at Montana tribal colleges in STEM majors. And you can tell from my smile, you know, that's my jam. So I, I love this. In 2003, she was selected as the Montana Indian Educator of the Year. In December 2016, she retired from MSU after 22 years, but she has remained active in promoting education as well as environmental health on her home reservation. She is currently involved as a consultant with two National Institute of Health funded grants at Northern Arizona University, focusing on improving the oral health of young Crow children on the Crow Reservation and a grant to increase awareness risks for Alzheimer's and other related dementia. She spends as much of her free time as possible with her three youngest great-grandchildren and traveling with her husband, the awesome Conrad Fisher. Sarah, welcome. We are just delighted that you are with us this evening. Well, good evening to all of you that are joining us this evening. I'm accused of talking too softly, so uh, if you can't hear me, uh, send a chat or something. Uh, or someone reach in there and um, let me know because I do, I, I am kind of a soft spoken person. Okay, if everybody can hear me, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And I'm, I'm just so glad that so many of you are interested in this topic. And it's a topic that I've lived with my whole life. 
uh, being a descendant of survivors. Um, my uh, grandparents, my grandfather went to Carlisle, my grandmother went to Shalako, my mother and father went to Haskell. And I'll tell you a little bit about my own boarding school experience towards the end. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I've titled this, The Boarding School Era, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And the reason I, I thought about that as I've been listening, I didn't, um, I didn't listen to the, the uh, live presentations, but I have gone through, taken the time to watch all five of the previous presentations that were all excellent and touching and challenging and somewhat painful sometimes too. And I thought, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the good also, because in life, sometimes even our struggles result in good things. They make us stronger, they make us more determined. And I think that um, as much as we talk about the pain of the boarding schools, we have to talk about the resilience and how it's brought us to where we are today. Let me see here. All right. I wanted to start uh, just by making everyone aware. We've talked so much about what was happening at the boarding schools, but there's some good news that I wanted to bring about, and this is a lot of text, but um, I want to start with this before I go into some of the, the bad and the ugly and some of the good. It's a quote from Secretary Deb Halen, who we're very proud of, the first Native American to be appointed to the Secretary of the Interior or Cabinet position. And uh, she's a member of the Laguna Pueblo tribe, a very um, honorable representative for us. She's doing incredible work. Her quote was, I know that this process in regards to the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative, Deb Halen said, I know that this process will be long and difficult. I know that this process will be painful. It won't undo the heartbreak and loss we feel, but only by acknowledging the past can we work towards a future that we're all proud to embrace. Those are good and powerful words that the secretary shared. And I think we've experienced that just in some of our sessions that we've had uh, through this very um, pertinent series on boarding schools. Thank you to um, Jennifer for setting this all up. Uh, in this, in June of, uh, 2021, just not that much after she had been um, uh, awarded, or however you say it, not awarded, uh, appointed by President Biden to her, her position a few months after that, she announced the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. And who would have thought, as we talked throughout our lives about all the all the hardships of the boarding schools. Who would have thought that a Native American would be sitting in that position and would, would call for uh, a federal Indian boarding school initiative? It's a comprehensive effort to recognize the troubled legacy of federal Indian boarding school policies. And with it is the goal of addressing their intergenerational impact and to shed light on the traumas of the past. I hope it will share more than just the, tra the traumas. I hope it will also share some of the good things as well, because there, there are always some, not always, but often some good things along the way, even during traumas. On May 11th of this, of this year, just a few months ago, Secretary Haland and her assistant, Secretary Newland, released volume one of the investigative report. And I have not read that report, but I uh, will have that as one of my uh, 
by my bedside when I have moments to read, uh, to start reading that investigative report that just came out a few months ago. It lays the groundwork for the continued work of the Interior Department to address the intergenerational trauma created by historic federal Indian boarding school policies. It reflects an extensive and first ever inventory of the schools, the 400 and some schools that have uh, scattered across this country, primarily in the West, but some in the East as well. As part of the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and in response to recommendations from the report, Hayland Holland has launched the Road to Healing. This year long commitment to travel across the country will allow American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian survivors of the boarding school system, the opportunity to share their stories, help connect communities and facilitate collection of a permanent oral history. A side note that, um, that Secretary Hayland commented when she was uh, talking about this initiative was that her grandparents were stolen from their families as children. And we must learn about this history. Uh, and so you know that it has a very personal uh, meaning. It has a lot of personal meaning, meaning to her, just as it does to me. A quote uh, that was also a part of that um, NPR uh, analysis or whatever, when they were at their meeting that the NPR had published was, and I, it really uh, tells a lot, uh, it says it so simply. And this is from a, um, a young woman um, who is president of the first Alaskans Institute. She's uh, Laquin Nay Liz Medicine Crow. And she said this in June during the meeting where she and uh, others were there and giving testimony at the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs when Hayland was, uh, was giving that first report. This quote really says a lot in just a few words. And my grandmother responded, I can tell you what happened physically, but I'm still not able to tell you what happened inside, Medicine Crow said, gesturing to her heart. And that's the story that I have because my mother spoke very little about what happened to her at Haskell. Um, and she did share, very rarely she shared some of the abuse that she went through, but she never talked about what was inside her heart. I wish we could have had that talk, but it wasn't something she was able to do. These are my grandparents, Frank Yarlett, and his wife, Plin uh, born, this is Frank Yarlett. He was born to um, his crow mother, Plenty Goose, or Plenty Door, excuse me, at the first agency of the Crow tribe near Livingston, Montana in 1883. He was sent to Carlisle in 1894 at the age of 11. He remained there for nine years and he graduated in 1903. When he returned, and I, I will state this, that when he returned, he did come home, but he went back to Pennsylvania a few times and stayed out there and worked. And, um, and even uh, a couple of my aunts were born out there. But he uh, came back home and then finally stayed home, stayed put and stayed home. Uh, and during that time, he was often called upon to represent the tribe on trips to Washington, DC as a tribal delegate, as he was respected for his skills in speaking and skills in um, being able to barely represent the tribe 
or at least by the group of people that, that would um, be the one that selected the delegates. And uh, next to Frank is uh, my grandmother, all important Yarlet, who was an enrolled member of the Potawatomi Nation. She was born in 1883 in Kansas when the Potawatomis were still up in Kansas, although they were later um, given allotments in down in uh, Oklahoma, and that's where their agency is now, Shawnee, Oklahoma. She attended Shalako Indian School in Oklahoma, uh, was right on the border just past Kansas, so close to her actual homeland there in Kansas and a ways away from where the um, Shawnee agency is now. After she completed, this was an older picture of her. I don't have a picture of her at Shilako. So after she graduated, she accepted a position to teach at the boarding school at Crow Agency, Montana. That was often the case. Many of the students, they, they went to Carlisle, Haskell or Schlock, wherever they might be, then they took positions in some of the schools because they had learned the things that they were still teaching in the schools for women, young women, young girls. They were taught homemaking and cooking and sewing, seamstressing, that sort of thing. And um, she went back to this, to, or she went to Crow and was teaching like canning classes and all of that, which very much impacted my life growing up. While she was there, she met that handsome young man, Frank Yarlett, and the two married and eventually had nine children. Two of those children died of tuberculosis, not at the boarding school, but actually at home. And we talk about um, how many deaths there were at the boarding schools, and there were many, far too many. But there were also deaths at home. And uh, I paid a price for that also, myself personally, about those two deaths. And we'll talk about that a little later, if I remember. I just wanted to show you, there's the logo of Carlisle Indian School. And I wanted to show you here is the Crow Reservation across this wide expanse of the United States. There in Pennsylvania was where Carlisle was located. It was a, here's a little map that you go on on the highways today. I'm not sure if that was exactly the same route in 1883 or 1894 when he went to Carlisle. The driving distance on today's highways is 1,803 miles, which is according to um, Google Maps or whatever I used, I can't remember which one I used. That's a 25 hour drive by today's standards. So two days if you drive 12 hours a day, uh, but if you do eight hours a day and rest, it's a three, three day drive today. And, um, in 1894, they were taken, of course, by rail. And it would have been a much longer trip. Some of the students, people say, actually weren't even in, they weren't in passenger cars, they were more like in rail cars. And uh, I believe he went there in October. I can't, I, I need to look up that date. I, I have looked it up on the, some of the records from Carlisle, but. Uh, Anyway, a long distance. They wanted to, uh, Pratt wanted to make sure the kids couldn't run back home and run away, although some did, of course. Here's some famous pictures. You know, we always like to look back at the pictures. The first picture on the left is some younger students at Carlisle. And this is about the age that my grandfather went. They look about like nine-year-olds. They were being taught finger songs. And 
I don't know how many of you know a lot about teaching languages, but one of the ways to teach languages is through songs because kids pick up songs quickly and they start picking up those words. And I doesn't say anywhere in the material that I read, primarily from Wikipedia, uh, easy, quick way to get information is to go to Wikipedia and uh, hope that most of their sources are fairly accurate, Con taking into consideration they were uh, not written by Native Americans, most of that material. Uh, very little has any quotes from Indians. But I know um, that when you teach little kids songs or even adults that are in, or young, young students that are learning French or Spanish or whatever they learn in school, uh, when you teach them music and singing, it's easier for them to pick up the words and uh, they can learn some of those words from singing. And I thought when I saw this picture, hmm, that they must have been doing that, uh, teaching those songs right away while they're small so that they would more easily pick up English. And, uh, but it was good that music and art were part of the school day. That was, that was, uh, that was very good that, that that was part of it because, um, you know, anymore in the United States, those are the first things that are cut from the curriculum as, as many of us that work in schools know, those things get cut from the curriculum. The other picture next to it, the picture on the right is again, some students at Carlisle and this is a graduating class, one of the, one of the early graduating classes um, could be late 19 or late 1890s or early 1900s. As I said earlier, my grandfather graduated from there in um, 1903. Uh, you can imagine, you know, that uh, when these young people, many of whom might not have ever gone home in the summer because one of the practices at Carlisle was to send students um, in uh, outing or I can't remember if it was called outing or outplacement uh, in the summer. And the boys went out and worked on farms or worked in other kinds of businesses, primarily farms so they could stay with the farm family. But of course they had to work while they were there and they were uh, getting a little bit of money for working as well as learning a little more hands-on about uh, some of the tasks of being a farmer. But can you imagine when they got off the train and they returned home, many of them probably went home by train. It's unlikely that their families drove out in an old Model T to pick them up or on a horse and buggy. They would have likely, most likely ridden home on the train and got off the train dressed like this and the family not having seen them for quite some time. Part of the good, bad, and the ugly. They look handsome. The young women look lovely, but not what they look like when they left home. I thought this was really amusing when I was reading some of the materials in the early or the late, well, I'm not sure what time in the 1890s, but after the school had been started, this uh, young woman um, had she had written a book, The School Days of an Indian Girl in the American 1890s, a cultural reader by, it was in, published in Duke University in 2000. This was a quote from a young girl. A small bell was tapped and each of the pupils drew a chair from under the table. Supposing this act meant that they were to be seated, I pulled out mine and at once slipped into it from one side. But when I turned my head, I saw that I was the only one seated and all the rest at our table remained standing. 
just as I was, just as I began to rise, looking shyly around to see how chairs were to be used, a second bell was sounded. All were seated at last, and I had to crawl back into my chair again. I heard a man's voice at the end, in the end of the hall, and I looked around to see him, but all the others hung their heads over their plates. As I glanced at the long chain of tables, I caught the eyes of a pale-faced woman upon me. Immediately, I dropped my eyes, wondering why I was so keenly watched by this strange woman. The man ceased his mutterings, and then a third bell was tapped. Everyone picked up his knife and fork and began eating. I began crying instead, for by this time, I was afraid to venture anything more. And you know, this was her first day at the school, first time going to the dining hall. Knew very probably little or no English, had never eaten maybe at a table. She had come from um, she had come from the reservation and early early era, and um, hadn't eaten in a, a public setting like that and hadn't heard someone standing up and praying in English at the end with everyone with their heads bowed. And she was just um, describing later about all these strange things that happened and how everything was to a bell. And why that struck me so personally was not because we had a bell at our home, but our life at home was almost like a bell ringing. My mother went um, to Haskell at age seven, I believe, seven or eight. And she stayed there till she was 17, never going home for a single vacation or trip to see her family. She was there about uh, 19, uh, 21, 20, 21. And she left there in 30 or 31. I, I don't have the exact dates down. And uh, she was with her sisters. I don't believe any of her brothers ever went there. They went to the brothers, she had two brothers, they went to Flandreau. But everything was by a bell at these boarding schools. Bell rang, you woke up. A bell rang, you went down to eat. A bell rang, you sat down. A bell rang, you were excused. A bell rang, you went to class. A bell rang, you got out of class. A bell rang, you got ready for dinner. A bell rang, you ate. A bell rang, you went back to your room or whatever if they had an evening event. And a bell rang when you went to bed. And um, so my mother was very regimented about getting up, about eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner at what she considered to be the right time, which was, of course, in alliance or aligned with how she was raised at this boarding school at Haskell. You ate at a certain time, you excused yourself, you did your chores, you went to school. Uh, if, if it was on the weekend at home, even on the weekend, we got up and we ate at a certain time. We ate lunch at noon. We ate dinner at five. Pretty much lights out by 10, at the very latest 1030. Um, everything was by a bell. And I think that's why this quote, when I was reading through some of these materials on Wikipedia, why it um, caught my eye, because um, I, I remember going to the prom and I think I got to stay out till two because one of my friend's mothers was having a, a little um, after prom, get together and we got to go and she had all kinds of food and they had a pool table and 
was a, a lot of us, maybe 20 of us got to go to that little party after the prom, but uh, so I got home late and it didn't matter what time you got home at my house, you could have got home much later than that. And you, first of all, you'd be in lots of trouble, but um, you still had to get up on a Saturday, no later than eight o'clock, Saturday and Sunday, no later than eight o'clock. So there were, there was a lot of significance to that silent bell that I grew up with. I uh, will talk a little bit more about Carlisle. And the reason I'm focusing a lot on Carlisle was because um, my grandfather's strengths and weaknesses impacted our family a lot throughout the generations. And that is, uh, that is where he went to school. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, good things about Carlisle too. I, I, I should just let you know about the curriculum, just like in all the curriculum at almost all these Indian schools, these boarding schools, the boys learned how to um, be blacksmiths. They learned how to take care of cows. They learned how to plant crops and harvest crops and all the tasks with farming. They learned how um, in some schools, even print shop work and that sort of thing. They learned how to do all kinds of industrial curriculum. And the girls learned how to prepare foods, canned foods, gardening. Um, and in some schools, even some areas of nursing, um, not certified nursing, of course, but some tasks of nursing. And in the early days, there, there wasn't really a certification for some of the nursing tasks anyway, because nursing wasn't taught in colleges at that time. It was taught at hospitals where you had hands-on real life experience in um, how to take care of sick patients. But one of the great successes of Carlisle Indian Industrial Institute was the football success. And I wanted to talk about that because <clears throat> nobody has talked about that. And uh, it's really kind of interesting because to me, that was the good, one of the most positive things, one of many positive things that came out of Carlisle because Native Americans um, uh, were recognized nationally because of their success with football. And we had been known only as these, as, as the newspapers and books and even early movies and what have you. We were known as savages and uncivilized and, and uh, all of the terrible descriptors that were so untrue about our people. But uh, in 1893, when we were first in these boarding schools that were built and established to assimilate Indians, one of the um, most successful assimilations was in sports. And um, so they had their first season in 1893, and they actually... Uh, they might have played a little bit before that, but uh, they were recognized by the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the NCAA, which still exists today, of course, and we all know uh, we were proud of our athletes that are uh, successful in those sports programs in colleges around the country. But anyway, uh, the Indians were consistently outsized by the teams they scheduled. And they in turn relied on speed and guile to remain competitive. Carlyle's playbook gave rise to many trick plays and other innovations that are now commonplace in American football. The overhand spiral throw and handoff fake are both credited to Carlyle. I don't know if there's any of you that are on the Zoom meeting 
football players or football fans or football mothers. Um, but uh, I thought that was pretty cool that those some of those things were credited to Carlisle. Other tricks play, trick plays were innovated by the Carlisle Indians and they cannot be used because the NCAA instituted rules specifically prohibiting them after Carlisle used them. The East Coast was uh, stunned by the success of these uh, Indians that came primarily from the West, although some were from some East Coast tribes as well, that they were coming and they were playing um, schools. Here's a picture of them, of one of their, a 1911 Carlisle Indian football team pose. And they're posing with a game ball. Uh, they're the fellow next to uh, Jim Thorpe is holding the ball. If you look up in the top back row, the, of course, the coach, the white guy in the suit, that's Pop Warner, famous football coach. And Jim Thorpe is in the picture, uh, third from the right, with his big C for Carlisle on his chest there, sitting there. Um, they had uh, an extremely successful seasons, a number of seasons where they were winning. They were beating, um, they beat Harvard and Yale and Brown and University of Pennsylvania. All these big powerhouse, prestigious Ivy League schools who had some of the wealthiest uh, kids, students from very wealthy families. And here was these reservation Indians just off the res had come in with braids and other hairdos, uh, not looking like this. They were wearing moccasins and, and uh, didn't even speak English when they got there. And here they were by 1911, beating all these prestigious schools. In, in 2022, we don't ever get a chance to have a all Indian basketball or football team playing that level of athletics. But, uh, so we have to call that the good. We have to see that, that there was some good that came out of that. Each of those people went back to their reservations as heroes. They were, um, you know, they, they hadn't gone out on a war party. They came young enough. They probably hadn't been out on a hunting party and brought back meat for the family, but they came home with a piece of paper that said that they had an education, a um, white man's education, but an education and a piece of paper that said they, they had uh, learned skills that would be able to get them jobs that other people in our, our, our uh, reservation communities couldn't have because they didn't have that piece of paper. But along with it, they had a letterman's jacket or a letterman's sweater. They had stories to tell. They didn't have hunting stories. They didn't have war party stories as their grandfathers would have had, but they had stories about beating Harvard, beating Yale, beating Brown, Maybe their grandparents didn't even know what those schools were. I don't know. But that was something that they, they knew was a big thing. They knew that was a big thing. There were articles written about them in national newspapers. And they were, they were athletic heroes. So I wanted to tell that story because I feel like um, we dwell a lot on, on the, the very painful, abusive, um, unjust things that happened at these schools. And each of these young men, if they came when they were nine, like my grandfather, um, they went through a lot. Um, they came 
many, many of them, not all, many of them not knowing any English, some knowing some English. Um, if they went to the um, trading post and what have you, they had learned a little English, um, maybe not much. Uh, maybe the early missionaries had taught them a little bit of English as well. Uh, and if they'd been sick and had been in a hospital or something, they'd learned a little English there. But for the most part, not speaking English. And yet here they were as a team. It takes a lot to be a winning team. It takes teamwork. It takes intelligence. And some of the things, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Pratt to also. Uh, the, the famous uh, Pratt, you know, we, we hear Pratt's quote, and all we really know about, about Pratt um, was that he had that terrible quote that has been thrown at us and thrown at us and thrown at us throughout our lives. Kill the Indian, save the man. And that was really the only quote that I knew about, about Pratt. And I knew that, that, um, that he had supported the uh, growth of the athletic program at the school as well. But I, I learned a little bit more about Pratt and our association with him is that quote. That's really what, what branded him in Indian families' minds, in my mind. Um, but actually there was a little more to this Pratt guy. And I, I wanted to just share a little bit of that. I'm gonna check the time here because I don't wanna go over. Um, so Pratt was this fellow who had been in the 10th Calvary during the uh, Civil War. And then after uh, the Civil War was over and so on, or I don't know, maybe he came into the military right after the Civil War, I'm not sure. I think he was in the Civil War though. But anyway, um, he, um, he actually got assigned to working with the, in the military, to working and commanding a post of a unit of African-American or as they were known, the Buffalo Soldiers and also Indian Scouts. And that was his actual first experience from 1869 to 1875. So six years he was working with the Buffalo Soldiers and the Indian Scouts, training them and militarizing them and getting them um, up to uh, that military level that they wanted them to be. This was at Fort Sills, Oklahoma, where he was based. And some people might say, I don't wanna hear about Pratt. Well, sometimes we need to look a little further than just what we think that we know. We think we don't know Pratt. We don't need to know anything beyond kill the Indian, save the man. He should have never uttered those words because that's what branded him. But 60 miles from there, the Battle of the Washita occurred, and that also um, involved Custer, George Armstrong Custer, when they attacked a peaceful band of Southern Cheyenne Indians with their chief, Black Kettle. And that was in 19, or excuse me, 1867. So uh, I guess he had been there, I said 1869, it was 1867. So early on when he was there, he was only 60 miles away from that. <clears throat> that uh, terrible event that occurred there at the Battle of the Washita. He loathed, he loathed the BIA and he, when he would go around, he would, uh, while he was at his station there at Fort Seals, he would file all kinds of complaints about the, the rations, the food, the, 
um, diseased livestock that they were sending, the inferior meat, ran rancid beef. He sent many, many um, complaints and uh, what have you, um, because they were the ones that had to hand these supplies out. Um, not only to their own men, but also to the uh, tribal people around the fort there. And so he blamed the BIA for all of this and he didn't like it. He was an army man, he wasn't a, a BIA man. Uh, let's see. So in 1875, he had another assignment, and that was to take 72 uh, Indians, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Comanche, and Cato Indians, Oklahoma Indians, or they were Oklahoma Indians at that time because they had been, uh, many of them forced into that area. So he was assigned, because by then the federal government was just like, you know, we we can't keep these uh, these Indians that still want to go to war with us and stuff. We can't keep them um, here. They're they're keeping things riled up and they're not letting the uh, assimilation take place. So they assigned Pratt to take these uh, seventy two prisoners to Augustine, Florida to be held hostage in exchange for good behavior from their families. They would use that as a, a way of um, saying, it, you know, if you're not good, something's gonna happen to your loved ones who we've taken and they're in prison out in um, Florida. And it was a, the prison called Fort Marion Prison. When they were leaving Oklahoma, the 72 prisoners were shackled and they uh, went again, I believe, by train. And when he got there, he took their shackles off and told them to begin, gave them uh, uniforms and told them to polish their buttons and shine their shoes and clean and press their trousers. And he wanted to instill in them the military viewpoint of taking pride in your uniform and what have you. And he actually started letting them, um, he asked that they didn't need the military guards anymore. And he had the uh, prisoners who were um, most receptive to learning the things he wanted them to learn. He had them um, become the guards of anybody that was breaking rules or what have you. And he let them go out and start working in surrounding communities and they had a little income. So he was developing these ideas about uh, that Indians were equal to anyone. As, he, as well, he thought that about Blacks because he had worked with the Buffalo soldiers. And that's how he came up with this grand scheme to start Carla, Carlisle Indian School was from his experience working um, with the, uh, the fellows that were up the Fort Marion prison, prison in Florida. So he had some good ideas, some bad ideas and some ugly ideas, but he, he started, um, so people would come down to Florida and vacation there because, you know, we all like to go to Florida, don't we? We've only been there a couple of times, but we always think about, I, I took a couple of my grand, three of my grandchildren to Disney World there and uh, took students there for conferences. But anyway, so people would come down there, wealthy people that were vacationing, and they'd go over to the, the Fort Marion prison to see these Indian prisoners. They were always, the East Coast people were always so curious about Indians from the West. And so they, some of them were wealthy and start donating money to him and what have you. So he started promoting this idea of starting a school out on the East Coast or East, Eastern United States, which eventually, of course, became Carlisle. 
with the idea of assimilating Indians because they couldn't be assimilated back on the res because they were always going to go home and hear their language. Their parents weren't going to send them to school. They'd go off hunting or doing whatever they do, go and travel to visit other relatives. And that he had to have them out there far away from all the cultural influences of their, of their um, tribe and their families and their loved ones. And he got that idea when he had taken these prisoners out to uh, Florida. So that gave me a little bit more history about this fellow named Pratt. And he went to Congress and asked for the money. He talked a lot about, um, he also had, um, while they were in prison there, given them the ledgers and had them start doing the ledger art that we're all so um, intrigued by the ledger art of, of those folks. There are over a thousand of those ledger artworks that are still um, surviving today. And um, some of the people, some of the um, prisoners would sell their artwork to these wealthy <clears throat> vacationers. So anyway, I just thought that that, um, that that was kind of an interesting uh, background about Pratt that we haven't really talked about. Does it, it doesn't ever justify his idea of having to assimilate Indians, his idea of kill the man, kill the Indian, save the man. But he had a lot of other quotes that I later learned about too, in which he was going to Congress or going to his donors and talking about the, the, that Indians were equal to anyone they could, if taught, they could learn and do anything any white man could do. He also continued his disregard for the BIA. And of course that eventually led to his being asked to uh, retire. So back to the, I know I'm kind of rambling around here, but back to the football. Who hasn't heard of Jim Thorpe? Almost everyone in the United States has heard of Jim Thorpe and Pop Warner. Uh, I just wanted to just say a little bit about this, about Jim Thorpe, because again, part of the good. In 1907, Jim Thorpe, who was not a very big man and compared to some of the other football players, asked to be on the team and of course, talked Pop Warner into it. And he led him and he actually became a starter, even though he was smaller than many of the other players. And that year, uh, the school played University of Pennsylvania and beat them 26 to six with a crowd of 20,000. And if you're just reading that, I was, I, I go to a number of the Denver Nuggets games and that stadium or that arena holds 20,000 at basketball games. And to think that our, um, our ancestors, our, our grandfathers, great grandfathers, and for some even great grandfathers, played football with that kind of audience, many of whom were cheering for the Indian team, not even cheering for their own team because they were so intrigued by these Indians. So a little more about Jim Thorpe after graduating from Carlisle. We all know he went on to stardom in numerous athletic endeavors, including um, being one of the most uh, successful Olympic athletes professional player in football, baseball, and basketball. We all know that this, that's not the end of that story. There was a lot of sadness. His, his Olympic medals were taken away from him because they accused him of getting paid, getting paid a few small amounts of money for playing semi-pro baseball, took his medals away, just wanted to dishonor him. Um, but eventually, recently, his uh, gold medals were, were reinstated. Uh, day late and uh, dollar short, but nevertheless, uh, movies were ma made about Jim Thorpe. Books have been written about him. And of course, we all know he, he had struggles. He had struggles. Those struggles were not because of the success he had in football, but probably the sadness of being taken uh, from his sack and pucks home and taken 
across the United States to the boarding school at, and having uh, to be away from his family and all the sadness and resulting alcohol, tr trouble with alcohol and, and what have you, um, part of the bad and the ugly. But when Watthorpe was there, the Carlisle Indians posted an 11 wins, one loss record, which included one of the greatest upsets in college football. Again, against Harvard and uh, Thorpe scored all the Indians points in a shocking upset over the period powerhouse. Harvard at that time was somewhat one of the most winning teams. The only loss for Carlisle came at the hands of Syracuse the following week and they lost 12 to one. Only lost one game and that was by one point in November 1912. Um, And when, when the team was going to go play at West Point, uh, and these are quotes, you know, I'm not saying that they're exactly like this, but this is what they, um, they say, is that Pop Warner said to them, your fathers and your grandfathers are the ones who fought their fathers. These men playing against you today are soldiers. They are long knives. You are Indians. Tonight, we will know if you are warriors. That night, Carlisle beat our, the Army football team 27 to 6. And that game was played just 22 years after the Battle of Little Bighorn. And also, uh, or not in Little Bighorn, at the battle at um, Wounded Knee, but also um, a little more than that for the Battle of uh, Little Bighorn, which was in 1876. And when they played Army, who was on the Army team? None other than former President Dwight Eisenhower. So a lot of interesting, intriguing things to smile about, things for families to talk about that gave them pride. But that success was one of the things that brought the end of of, of the school eventually, because they felt the school was having too much emphasis on sports. The, the government, the Bureau of Indian Affairs or, or whatever the government agency was that was saying, no, we're not gonna fund this anymore. They're putting too much emphasis on sports. So uh, also just not to leave the girls out, I put a picture of the Carlisle girls basketball team in the early 1900s. And for those of you that might not know about the Fort Shaw Indian girls basketball team from Montana, which was up on the high line and was mostly uh, girls from tribes, Fort Belknap, and um, maybe Fort Peck and certainly Blackfeet that went to the Indian world or the, the uh, World's Fair in St. Louis and uh, ended up being the world champion girls basketball team and they came from the Fort Shaw Indian boarding school. I know that story well because my good friend and colleague Mary Lucan from Browning who also worked at Montana State University um, uh, was active in getting the story written about um, her family, her mother's, um, let me see, was it her mother's sister? No, or maybe her aunt, I can't remember. I should remember that Mary would be uh, disgusted with me for not remembering, but it was either her mother's older sister or her aunt, someone in that family anyway, that played on that Fort Shaw team. And they uh, they actually reenacted that game at Montana State University during the powwow one year. We had uh, some of the basketball players from MSU's women's team and a team of Indian, talented Indian girl basketball players that played against them. And they, they actually made uniforms like the Fort Shaw girls. So those were things that were some good things for us to remember. Back to Pratt. Pratt conflicted with government officials over his outspoken views on the need for Native Americans to assimilate. And he denounced the Indian Bureau, it was called Indian Bureau, Bureau at that time, not BIA, and the reservation system. And one of his other quotes were, better, far better for the Indians had there never been a bureau. And you know, we don't, his reason was because he wanted Indians to not be on the reservations and to be assimilated and so on. But how many Indians 
in our communities. How many of us have heard people say, we should get rid of the BIA? Well, Pratt was saying that, or its earlier version, as early as 1903. He was forced to retire as the superintendent of Carlisle after 24 years and later and was placed on the retired list as a brigadier general in the US Army uh, because this was an army assignment. He and his wife traveled all over afterwards and they often visited their former students and lectured and still continued writing on Indians. So he's buried at Nash Arlington National Cemetery and on his tombstone, it says, erected in loving memory by his students and other Indians. So we have a love-hate relationship with Pratt because of our association with that fateful quote of his. I talked a lot about Carn Carlel, and uh, I, I wanted to share another little story. I met a Mohawk man in 1965 at, at a conference for American Indian students that were out in the East Coast at boarding schools at the time. Not Indian boarding schools, prestigious boarding schools that uh, uh, the wealthiest children in America go to. And we were at a conference at, Boston, at Cambridge near the Harvard campus there. And uh, they had a panel of speakers come and talk to us, one of which was a Mohawk man. This was in 1965 way before the other presenters were born and, and you're, you, you, uh, those of you in the audience probably have grandparents or great grandparents that age. And he was talking to us, 16 Indian kids that were out there at the time in the East Coast. And he said, I went to Carlisle and that was the best education a person could get. I am, I've been a successful man all my life, and it's because of Carlisle Indian School. I've had jobs and I've supported my family. And I had a better education than these schools you think you're getting so much, you're getting so smart at. And he pretty much just kind of told us off and told us that his education at Carlisle is as good as anything that we were getting, which of course we were kind of skeptical about at the time. But those words stuck with me because I thought, you know, he had a lot of pride. I'm sure he went through a lot of pain at, at Carlisle too, but yet he had a lot of pride. Maybe it was false pride, who knows, but he felt like it had prepared him to be able to provide for his family, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Haskell Indian Institute. Here again, we see those uniforms, we see the um, dresses that the girls were wearing, knowing that they were not comfortable in these clothes, they felt awkward and unfamiliar with these clothes and they felt like they were losing their culture and their identity, which was of course, was the whole purpose for these 408 boarding schools that were established across the country. And they wanted Indian children to lose their language, their everything about their culture, dancing, uh, powwow singing, spiritual beliefs, family plan systems, um, communal values. All of that was to be erased by these boarding schools. And with the good came the pain trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, suicidal rates, all because of all the bad that came out of these schools. But some of the people, some of the students adjusted better than others and probably came home like some of my, one of my aunts worked for the Indian Health Service for 40 years as a registered nurse, one of my aunts worked for the, actually for the tribe, but assigned at the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 40 years in the um, tribal loan program. She worked there as a bookkeeper for 40 years. And another one of my aunts worked at the school with the 
food program. And another one of my aunts married a Choctaw and stayed down in Oklahoma because she had gone to Pasco, but then younger than all the other kids, she she ended up getting sent over to Bacon and met a Choctaw and married and had a um, a, a good life down in uh, Poto, Oklahoma, where the Choctaws live. Okay. Um, I wanted to show when you look at the Haskell Indian Institute uh, history pages, one of the things, one of the pictures that's on this Wikipedia site, these are long sites too. I think the Carlisle site has 38 pages when you print it out. And I'm old school, I like to print things out. I love technology, but I still like to print things out. But anyway, uh, I thought, 1884, they already had a cemetery. And my first reaction to that was deaths began early in the boarding school era. But I want to be fair and say that there were a lot of deaths of children, you know, farmers and ranch, not so much, I don't know about ranchers, but a lot of the farming homesteaders and stuff. They had a lot of deaths and they had a lot of children because they knew some of their children would probably die in the cold and damp, um, harsh winters. And their children died. And when tuberculosis hit, um, there were not just Indian children that died of tuberculosis. There were children all over the country that, that did die of tuberculosis. And as I said earlier, my mother had. Um, two siblings that died very young because of tuberculosis. And as I said, my mother was very impacted by being sent away. She never ever saw her mother again. Her mother died while my mother was still in Oklahoma and she uh, in Caton at Haskell. And my mother never saw her mother again. She. She last saw her when she was around seven or eight, when she was sent to Haskell. She wasn't rounded up by the police or by the um, soldiers or any of the atrocities that we hear about in Canada and some, and some other um, reservations, but rather uh, her mother and father had divorced and the mother had seven surviving children and they were taken away and sent to boarding school um, with the father's approval. Because after all, he had gone to Carlisle at nine. That's what you do. You get programmed. He was programmed to believe his brother and his sister also went to Carlisle when his, his only brother became a chairman of our tribe at one time. His sister was um, a very progressive woman for her time had her, had, uh, had her own home built, not a BIA home, not a tribal home, her own home built. She was active in politics in Montana, um, was trying to get the vote for women. Um, and she, they had also gone to Carla. But um, so there were a lot of deaths. And I wanna uh, really acknowledge a young woman younger than me, uh, Marcia Small at Montana State University, Bozeman. If you don't know her and you don't know about her work, you should, you should look it up. Uh, she finished her master's and she did her master's uh, thesis on, on her studies on identifying grave sites, especially unmarked graves at boarding schools. She started with Chamawa Indian School in Oregon. And, uh, I'm not sure, but I believe that she, that might be where she went to boarding school. Um, but she's now uh, working on her doctorate and, and expanding on her original research. And she's given talks all over the country. She's been to boarding schools in many, many places here in the United States of these uh, former boarding schools uh, using um, technology to try to find where bodies are buried and, and what have you um, that are in unmarked graves. And she's really done a lot. 
remember that name, Marsha Small. I wanna, it was her birthday the other day too. And uh, uh, when she first started doing this, I thought, oh man, that sounds pretty gory. But do you know that because of that work, a number of the families have received the remains of their loved ones through uh, some of the work that Marsha, and not Marsha alone, but others, but, but she's a member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe, grew up there on the reservation, and is really making a name for herself and uh, being successful with her, with her uh, graduate work. In, in, it's not just her graduate work, it's her passion. But uh, I just wanted to point that out. So because my mother, uh, had lost these siblings of tuberculosis at a young age. And because there were kids at Haskell that did get sick and die of tuberculosis and other things, um, my mother was deathly afraid of tuberculosis. It was almost a paranoia for my mother. And I don't know why, but for whatever reason, None of my other siblings were ever um, thought to have TB by my mother. But for what I was the youngest of, of, the, of the children at that time. She later raised two other grandchildren and they were younger. But my mother thought I had TB because I have a uh, historically had a chronic cough. We still have a chronic cough. I haven't even coughed during this presentation. Praise the Lord. But anyway, my mother would uh, take me down to the Indian Health Service clinic at Crow, where my aunt was a nurse. And she would tell the doctors that I coughed all night and I, I want her tested for TB. And I should ask to go and look at my chart at Crow if, it, if it's still available from the early uh, mid to late 50s and early 60s. My mother took me many times to the Indian Health Service, insisting that they give me a TB test. And after a while, the doctors would say, Mrs. Young, your daughter does not have TB. And she'd say, I want her tested. She has, she's been coughing all night. And all my tests came out negative. I never, I never did have TB, but I do have a cough, and uh, I am, I, I, I know that it was because she lost these siblings at an early age at home before she went off to boarding school, and also she lost friends at uh, the boarding school or kids that she knew about that died there at Haskell because of TB. So um, I survived the the silent bells, I survived the TB testing. Um, one of the things that uh, I remember my mother telling us was when she was young in high school, she was a teenager, just like all teenagers. I'm not quite sure what teenagers did in pre-reservation days to get into mischief or to be daring, but one of the things my mother and my aunt Florence Doyle um, Shane Doyle, for those of you that know my nephew Shane, his, his grandmother, they would break a brick on the sidewalk and they'd get the powder, the little grains of the red brick powder, and they'd get it wet and they would put it on their lips to make their lips look red like they had lipstick on. And when they'd get, and of course they wanted, and they were very pretty women, I should have put pictures of them on and I just uh, didn't um, have, been pretty this has been kind of a busy time for me and I, I didn't get a chance to put their pictures up but um, they wanted to have red lipstick on which was not allowed like every almost anything that they could think of at Haskell there was a rule for that you couldn't do and the matrons would grab her by the ear and pull her back to the dorm and she'd be dormed for putting that red brick powder on her lips to look pretty. And, um, so to, that, to this day, my eldest female cousin, Deanna Dreamer, uh, was 84 now, I believe. 
and she and I, uh, when we take our picture together, we put red lipstick on before we take our picture. And we say, and Deanna says, when she looks in the mirror and she puts her red lipstick on, she says, this is for you, mama. And uh, so just one of the uh, struggles that they had at, at the boarding school. You might think, well, that's silly. That's no big deal. Uh, but it was just that uh, suppression, that constant suppression. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other stories about my mother at Haskell that we didn't ever hear from our mother, but my, um, my youngest aunt, Lillian, who was there for a short while before she went to Bacon, on one, uh, while she was there, my mother um, apparently must have been feistier than she led us to believe because she was punished a number of times like many of the students. And their punishment for my mother was not spanking her or, or that hitting her, but rather they locked her upstairs in an attic with no light and no window for several days at a time. And they would just take her food up to her, open the door and put the tray beside the door, take the old tray and put down the new tray. And she had to eat in there. I, I have no idea what, how she used the bathroom or anything like that. But uh, my Aunt Lillian told the story. My mother never told us because she didn't tell us those things. But my aunt told my sister, um, this was my aunt that was married to a Choctaw. She told my sister that also lives in Oklahoma and she's now 88, that she was so sad for her sister that she waited till everyone was asleep and then she would sneak up in the dark, climb the stairs quietly and go sit by the door of the attic and talk to my mother through the door for as long as she felt it was safe. And then she would sneak back down the stairs and back to where her sleeping quarters were and uh, go to sleep before she had got caught. And she must have been really good because she never got caught. But uh, so then later in life, when my mother had children, how did she punish her older children? She would lock them in the basement and say, you have to stay down there for one hour. You, you disobeyed me or whatever it might've been. These are the stories my sisters have told us. And uh, my sisters were not known for being particularly brave girls. They were a little bit on the scaredy cat side. And so they would sit at the top of the stairs until my mother would come and open the door. And my brother, on the hand, other hand, when he was sent to the basement, he would just crawl out the window, go play. He knew how long mother would last before she'd let him upstairs. And he'd just go back in the window and go back and act like he'd been in the basement the whole time. I wanted to say to my sisters, hmm, I think my brother was smarter than you girls. But anyway, those were trauma things that my mother learned. Those were behaviors my mother learned. My dad, on the other hand, he didn't go to Haskell for any of those reasons, and he wasn't um, there at a young age. He went to school at Miami, Oklahoma. He played football at Miami High School, was a star football player. He went to Miami College, junior college, played football, and the Haskell coach came and recruited him to play football at Haskell. And he went to their post-secondary training there and studied a course called Boys Counseling. I have no idea what that means. And I know my dad never got any work skills out of it and never worked at it, but um, that's what it was called. And that's how he met my mother. And they, um, when my mother was 17, having never left the college or the campus, the Haskell campus, except for the summer work um, as a maid, they would let her go and work for different families as a maid. And, and uh, other than that, she had never been away from the campus. And at 17, she ran away with this handsome football player, who by the way, was the poster with the 
war bonnet on for the Haskell football team. They ran away, they caught a train and went back to Oklahoma. And when they got there, Haskell had already called the police. They knew where he was going, where he was from, and the police met him at the train station. And uh, they called back to the reservation, got a hold of my grandfather, and he said, I give my permission for her to marry him. And uh, my grandfather had come every year for about three weeks and stayed there at Haskell and visited his children. And that was the only time they saw a parent was once a year when their dad came for his once a year, three week visit. But he gave her permission. He really liked my dad and they, uh, they got along quite well. So those were some of the impacts that, um, that I grew up with in the, um, the, uh, the regiment, regimental behaviors that we, we had to deal with. Um, you might think that I um, would have resented some of that behavior or, or what have you, but I really didn't. And I told myself many times when I lay in bed at night, I was a pretty good counselor for myself. And I would tell myself, um, um, she had no parents, she was alone. All, all those many years with no one to hug her or, or give her presents or be kind to her. And you have to understand that, um, that's why some of her behaviors are the way they are. And I don't know why at age eight, seven, eight, nine, I had that kind of insight as a child, but I did. And I never ever got mad. And uh, one of my prayers was when I prayed as a little girl, as my mother taught me to pray a lot from the time I was a small child. And one of my prayers was always, Lord, don't let my mother die before me. I couldn't live without my mother. And I loved her despite all of those bells that she heard in her head, all of those rules and regulations and fears and expectations. And uh, because I understood I wanted to just talk a little bit about something else before we're ready to go. I was thinking about the whole issue about the cutting of the hair. And I know if you're not from an Indian community, those of you teachers that are on there, um, you might be thinking all this time and you hear all of us complain about the cutting of the hair. Um, you might think, well, what's the big deal about the hair? I was thinking about that today and I added this slide. And I just wanted to say, well, I better, maybe someone hasn't really told them why it's such a big deal. And so I said, Conrad, you're a former director of the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Historic Preservation Office. You've studied anthropology and archeology, span those condemned careers. You know all about these things. You were Dean of the Cultural Affairs at Chief Dalnife College, a drum keeper of the tribe still is the drum keeper, former councilman and vice president. You know all these things. You're a traditional singer, a fluent speaker of the Cheyenne language. Give me some short words on what's the big deal about the hair. Of course we know, but I wanted to just share that, not for the Indian audience, but for those non-Indian teachers who maybe don't, haven't quite um, had anybody explain that. But hair is a form of cultural identity for Native Americans at least, and, and many other people as well. But the actual cutting of hair was primarily done in Indian cultures. And during the time of mourning, people's hair were cut and people still cut their hair when they lose a loved one. They still uh, have, they have a ceremony just to have their hair cut after the loss. And so it was done for mourning, so when these young children, not, not just for mourning, but also when a tragic event occurred in the family or with a family member. And uh, when people cut their hair at the ceremony before the funeral, uh, people are crying as their hair are cut. And so why wouldn't those children, when their hair was cut, their braids were cut off, um, why wouldn't they cry? Why wouldn't they feel a sense of loss? That's when you, that's what you do when, when you're mourning. Your hair is cut. 
Also, hair is part of your body like a limb. I think that a lot of cultures don't look at hair that way. The dominant culture does not look at hair as part of your body. Um, it's like a limb and cutting it is like a sim symbolic of sacrificing part of yourself as it is when, when you have a loss. So it's a part of your body. Another example of, of hair being a big deal. Scalps were often taken as a first step after killing an enemy, in essence of stealing their spirit. This is just one example of the importance of hair to Native Americans culturally. Um, also, hair was groomed and taken care of to the conformity of the particular tribe's style. And um, uh, it was a, an important gesture of caring to, to groom someone's hair. Hair was not thrown away and still is not thrown away or disposed of lightly. It was usually wrapped in a cloth or a piece of buckskin and buried in the ground or in some cases burned. And I remember my aunt who was probably my most uh, culturally, traditionally following lifestyle of my family and often telling us about um, not cleaning our brush and just throwing our hair away, but rather to, to bury it or burn it. Most often she suggested we burn it. Um, hair is also symbolic of your cultural heritage and serves as a status in different settings. Oh, and I, I repeated that one about the scalp, sorry about that. So those were just, and I just thought about that as an afterthought as I was uh, getting ready for the presentation. So that's just a little side note about why, why, what's the big deal about hair? It's a big deal, believe me, it's a big deal. Here's some hairstyles that stood out, and I mean stood out. We crows, we love the original, the hairdo of our famous crow chiefs, our crow warriors, our crow loved ones. And, and uh, if you come to the crow fair parade, sometimes you'll see men that have actually um, uh, also uh, replicated this hairdo. Our, our most famous, our chief of chiefs, Pliny Coos. This is a picture of him in 1908 taken. Both of these pictures were taken by the famous photographer, Edward Curtis. And uh, I got them, swiped them off of Wikipedia. And uh, you see that pompadour of both of these handsome crow men. When they were riding horseback all across the plains and other tribes might be have scouts out or whatever, they saw them. They knew immediately they were crows. How could you not know when you see this hairdo? Other tribes have very distinct hairdos as well. Uh, but I just wanted to share that hair is a big deal. I just have a few minutes left. Yes, and Sarah, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I do have a few things to, to close with. Um, okay, I won't tell the rest of this. That's okay. Well, what you what we can do is we can um we can stop the recording and then um we can we can oh, we, if folks want to stay. That would be great. But um I just I wanted to let you know that there were some really um there are some comments and I'm sorry that I've I've lost track of them, but one I, I did want to share in particular um, about Jim Thorpe's mother was Potawatomi. He is my fourth cousin. My great grandmother and his mother were sisters from Shawnee, Oklahoma. His mother died in childbirth when he was about 10. Most writings of him only say he is Sack and Fox. So I just wanted to Well, to share I'm, that. I'm Potawatomi also, and I'm always glad to know another Potawatomi. Because is, growing up at Lodgegrass, when I'd tell my classmates I was Potawatomi, they would laugh and say, Sarah, there's no such tribe, you're just Crow. And uh, they didn't like it because I'd say I was part Potawatomi. So I kind of quit telling them because they, they thought I made it up. Well, I just want to say thank you so, so much, Sarah. I could not have asked for a better closing presenter for our series. And I would sure love it, you know, if, if, 
to have you share more, you know, eventually. And so, and uh, while you were talking, um, your your nephew Shane Doyle um, checked in with me. So um, it's so it's, we're all in the same wavelength, all related. But um, I just thank you so much. Folks, thank you so much for coming to this series, and uh, I just can't thank you enough for your your feedback and 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 ha how that helped create this series. Um, I have put some information about best practices. It will be March seventeenth and eighteenth. We'll send you a, a special letter just to to you registrants for the boarding schools uh, once we get more information on our uh, on our workshops that will happen. But I just want to say thank you so much to all of you. Um, this was intense but amazing. I learned so much, and I just am so humbled uh, by the the generosity of all of our presenters. So with that, I say thank you to everyone. And um, I just really, I really appreciate everyone's involvement. And I can't wait to do a little bit more with this. So thank you all very much.